Okay, let's open our Bibles to the book of Matthew, chapter 3. Again, Matthew, chapter 3. And last time I discussed the difference between the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God. They are not synonymous. Verse 2, here in Matthew 3, says, John the Baptist came preaching, quote, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven, notice, is at hand. Christ began preaching the same thing. Look over at chapter 4, and notice there, verse 17. From that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And also verse 23. Jesus went about all Galilee, preaching in their synagogues, and preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and uh, healing all manner of sickness and all manner of disease among the people. The word gospel, or good news, was the good news that the kingdom of Israel's rule, once again, over the other nations, under their Messiah, was about to appear. Look back, if you will, at the book of Daniel, chapter 7. Go back to Daniel 7. Daniel 7. And notice there, verses 13 and 14. I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven, and came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. And there was given him dominion, and glory, and a kingdom, that all people, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away, and his kingdom, that which shall not be destroyed. Verse 27. And the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High, whose kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and all dominions shall serve and obey him. Look back at chapter 2, Daniel 2. Daniel 2, verses... 44 and 45. Daniel 2, verses 44 and 45. And in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. For as much as thou sawest that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, and that it break in pieces the iron, the brass, the clay, the silver, and the gold, the great God hath made known to the king what shall come to pass hereafter, and the dream is certain, and the interpretation thereof sure. That which is called the kingdom of heaven is a reference to the ultimate rule of the Messiah over the literal, physical planet Earth one day, and the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the Jews, as the rightful heirs of that kingdom. And um, they will have dominion over it. <clears throat> the eternal struggle among nations and politicians has always been who is going to rule over who? That's the eternal question. Who is ultimately going to be in charge? Notice uh, uh, Matthew 6, look forward to Matthew 6, and verses 31 to 33. Therefore take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For all, For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Before the honor of the kingdom of heaven uh, would be theirs, the humility of the kingdom of God uh, had to be shown. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Uh, look at that same parallel in, in another place. Uh, Matthew chapter 20, if you will. Matthew 20. Matthew chapter 20. And 
Begin there at verse 25. <clears throat> but Jesus called them, his apostles, unto him, and said, Ye know that the princes of the Gentiles exercise dominion over them, and they that are great exercise authority upon them. In other words, there's this ascending uh, order or chain of command in earthly governments and kingdoms, or descending, however you look at it. Verse 26, But it shall not be so among you. But whosoever will be great among you, let him be your minister. And whosoever will be chief among you, let him be your servant. Even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister, and to give his life a ransom for many. Uh, also, that's a great verse testifying to the fact that the Vatican and the papacy and the Catholic Church are not Christianity. They are not the church of Jesus Christ because Christ said it would not be so among his apostles, his disciples. They wouldn't be patterned after the world's system of government structures, which the Vatican certainly is. The Pope is the last absolute monarch in all of the European nations. Any other kings and royal bloodlines are nothing but figureheads today. But two kingdoms were being offered to the nation of Israel. One heavenly, or rather uh, the kingdom of heaven, which was physical, and the kingdom of God, which was spiritual. One was necessary before they would be qualified to receive the other. Uh, but Jews are still here today because God intends to keep his promises eventually to them. Our text, Matthew 3 and verse 3, says, and, For this is he that was spoken of by the prophet Esaias, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. Look at that uh, uh, similar passage there in uh, Mark chapter 1. Go forward to Mark chapter 1. <clears throat> Mark 1, and the first three verses there. Mark 1, verses 1, 2, and 3. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as it is written in the prophets, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. Both Matthew and Mark, quoting from Isaiah uh, chapter 40, verse 3. Your authorized version says, as it is written in the prophets, plural, because two different prophets are being quoted. Verse, verse 2 is from the prophecy of prophet Malachi, Malachi 3 and verse 1. Verse 3 is from Isaiah chapter 40. All of the new, up-to-date, clearer, more understandable, new and improved modern Bible versions all say, as it is written by Isaiah the prophet, singular. That is a factual mistake in your Bible. If you want to point out to someone that there's an actual, provable, demonstrable, factual mistake in the modern Bibles, take them to Mark 1 and show them that two prophets are being quoted. So when you say, uh, verse 2, the prophecy of Malachi is attributed to having been written by Isaiah the prophet. That's false. That's incorrect. Two prophets are being quoted. So the Bible correctly says, as is written in the prophets, plural, not Isaiah the prophet, singular. But so it goes. Verse 4 in our text And the same John had his raiment of camel's hair and a leathern girdle about his loins, and his meat was locusts and wild honey. Look back, if you will, at 2 Kings chapter 1. 2 Kings chapter 1. It's right after 1 Kings, 2 Kings. And just before 2 Kings chapter 2. 2 Kings chapter 1. And notice there verses 7 and 8. 
And he said unto them, What manner of man was he which came up to meet you and told you these words? Verse 8. And they answered him, He was an hairy man, and girt with a girdle of leather about his loins. And he said, It is Elijah the Tishbite. You can't help but notice John's similarity to Elijah the prophet. Um, turn back uh, to the end of the Old Testament, the book of Malachi. Malachi chapter 4. And notice there Malachi 4, and verses 5 and 6. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children, and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. Both Isaiah and Malachi foretold of Elijah the prophet coming before the appearing of the Messiah. And so Mark, uh, verse one or chapter one, verses one to three, quotes from both of those two prophets about the coming of John the Baptist, and the Lord Jesus uh, confirmed the prophecy of Elijah. Look forward at Matthew seventeen. Matthew seventeen. Uh, verses 10 and 11. Matthew 17, verses 10 and 11. And his disciples asked him, saying, Why then say the scribes that Elias must first come? And Jesus answered and said unto them, Elias truly shall first come and restore all things. Uh, then Christ adds that under certain conditions, John the Baptist would fulfill Elijah's coming. Look at verses 12 and 13. But I say unto you that Elias is come already. And they knew him not, but have done unto him whatsoever they listed. Likewise shall also the Son of Man suffer of them. Then the disciples understood that he spake unto them of John the Baptist. Um, and also look back at chapter 11, Matthew 11. Matthew 11 and verses 12 to, 13, 12 to 14. Matthew 11, verses 12 to 14. And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence, and the violent take it by force. For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John. And if ye will receive it, this is Elias, which was for to come. Uh, put your finger in Luke chapter 1. I know I'm having to bounce around a lot. We'll get to our text soon. Luke 1. And also go back again to Malachi chapter 4, just the last page in the Old Testament. Luke 1 and Malachi chapter 4. Malachi 4, let me read verses 5 and 6 again. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. He shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to their fathers lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. And also Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1, verses 16 and 17, speaking of John the Baptist. Verses 16 and 17. And many of the children of Israel shall he turn to the Lord their God, and he shall go before him in the spirit and power of Elias to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready a people prepared for for the Lord. You compare their two offices, their two ministries. John the Baptist came preaching repentance of sin to prepare the listeners, the hearts of the people, to receive the Messiah when he finally showed up. Um, his was distinct from Elijah's ministry, Elijah's office, yet it was similar enough that if the nation had received and embraced Jesus Christ, uh, John would have satisfied the prophecy of Elijah coming again before the day of the Lord. Both men, Elijah and John the Baptist, were ultimately beheaded. John the Baptist in Mark chapter 6 under Herod the king, and Elijah eventually in, Ma in Revelation chapter 11, one of the two witnesses. 
both men were forerunners of the Lord Jesus Christ. Both men dressed alike, and uh, uh, both men faced someone who was a type of the Antichrist in their day. Elijah faced Ahab and his wife Jezebel. Um, John the Baptist faced uh, Herod. Now, up until now, everything is set for the prophets to be fulfilled and the kingdom of heaven to appear on the earth. Two kingdoms were being offered. So Christ told them, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, so forth and so on. That is the kingdom which was within, and it would prepare you for the one which would come without. And it was for this purpose that John the Baptist came, preaching in the wilderness and baptizing uh, at the Jordan River. Look at verses 5 and 6 in our chapter today, Matthew 3, verses 5 and 6. Then went out to him, John the Baptist, Jerusalem, and all Judea, and all the region round about Jordan, and were baptized of him in Jordan, confessing their sins. Verse 6 says, and were baptized of him in Jordan, not near the Jordan River, or sprinkled on the head near the edge of the river, but the implication is that they went down into the water, in the Jordan River. Couldn't be any plainer than that. Um, it's important to pay attention to every single word in your Bible, because it's there by the providence and the will of God to instruct you and I. And I've gone through only a few verses, and we covered a whole lot just in the, the last few minutes. But there is the case to be made for rightly dividing the word of truth. If you don't rightly divide the word of truth, then something that was intended for one person, you'll uh, wrongly think it applies to you or it applies to all Christians in all times. Not, not so. Moses said to the Jews, Deuteronomy 6, verse 25, And it shall be our righteousness if we observe to, to do all these commandments before the Lord our God as he hath commanded us. Do what he's told us to do, and do it how he's told us to do it. And it would result in our righteousness in the eyes of God. The, that was to be kept up until the coming of the Lord Jesus. It was still in effect in uh, the time of Christ's birth. Before Christ was born, Luke chapter 1 and the birth, a conception of John the Baptist, who was six months older than Christ, it says of John the Baptist's parents, Zacharias and Elizabeth, they were both righteous before God. How? Walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord, blameless. Luke 1, verse 6. That's how someone was identified and defined as being righteous before God, before the coming of Jesus Christ. And yet the Apostle Paul says, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us uh, by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. Titus 3, verse 5. It's the Holy Ghost who washes and regenerates and renews the sinner who turns to Jesus Christ as a sinner in need of God's forgiveness. It has nothing to do with how good he is to try to earn, earn it or merit it and get God's attention and hope God will look favorably towards him and give him some special blessing of forgiveness in heaven. It has nothing to do with your goodness or achievement uh, or lack of those things. It has everything to do with you trusting what he's already done for your sake. But that righteousness in the Old Testament times had to be maintained up until your death. Go, if you will, to the book of Ezekiel. Ezekiel and... Chapter 18. So if someone was known for doing good, doing more good than bad, trying to keep the commandments as they had been given to Israel, if someone was known for having a regard to the law of God and the commandments given to the nation of Israel, that person was referred to as a good man, a just man, a devout man, uh, someone who was not faithful, someone who was known for doing more bad than good, was sometimes called an evil man, a wicked man, a fool, an unrighteous man in the Old Testament. And the sad thing is that 
people seem to think that that's how God defines people today. That's how God will decide if you get to heaven or if your good deeds outweigh your bad deeds on some cosmic scale, then you'll go to heaven. But if your bad outweighs your good, you'll go to hell. And that'll all be measured out and you'll see some balance uh, scales, a, a judgment somewhere, and you, you'll be a surprise to you to know where I'm going. Gosh, I hope the scales tip this way. I hope they don't tip. That's not how God judges whether men go to heaven or hell. You're judged on your, sal your, your salvation is determined by what you do with Jesus Christ right now. It has nothing to do with how good you are, how good you hope to be, how good you've been over the totality of your life. And I used this illustration before. Let's suppose someone has been living for himself. He hasn't really given God any time, any thought. He hasn't considered the scriptures. He never considered his own soul. He's never considered the plan of salvation that Jesus Christ suffered for the sake of the sinner. And by a simple act of faith and putting all of his trust in what Christ did, those sins can be forgiven. Uh, his soul can be washed clean. And a home in heaven is waiting for him. Let's suppose someone has never considered their own soul. They've only lived for themselves, right? lived to satisfy myself, to enjoy life, have a good time. And I want to make enough money to pay my bills and take care of my children and family, you know, but, and I have a few toys and a few things to spend my money on and have some nice vacations and party once in a while and enjoy my friends and do a lot of things that everybody else is doing. And they've never really thought beyond themselves and their own interests. And then they reach to the age of about 40. And something strikes them as, you know what? You can't just live your life for yourself. You have to live your life with other people in mind. You have to live your life uh, with greater things in mind than just you and your own happiness. It's not how much you get for yourself. It's how much you do for someone else. That's They've been told this philosophy. So suddenly they're convicted about doing good things rather than bad things. So now they say, from now on, I'm going to try and do more good than bad. I'm going to start going to church. I'm going to start giving money to this worthy cause or donating to some charitable effort. I'm going to make sure my kids are raised well and taught well. And I'm going to do a number of things that my wife wants me to do. And we're going to go to church. We're going to do a number of things that uh, I should probably do spiritually related. And he thinks now he's, he's making up for all those years of lost time. But you can't make up for it. Because even though you have a different approach to life, you don't do good all the time. The, at the very best, you, you're breaking even. You know, half the time you, you cheat on your income tax. The other time you're honest with, about how, how much you made. But you're already 40 years behind. You've already got 40 years to make up for. How are you going to make up for it, living with that philosophy? So there's no way in the world the totality of all your goodness will ever get you to heaven because you've never done enough. You'd have to be, the Lord Jesus told the, 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 the apostles, except your righteousness shall exceed that of the scribes and the Pharisees, ye shall not enter in the kingdom of heaven. The Pharisees and the scribes are very devout and very devoted men. They were lost and they were doing it to be seen of men. But he says, you have to be better than them if you hope to get in. But Ezekiel 18, notice there, verse 24. But when the righteous, we already identified that a righteous man in the Old Testament was somebody who was known for doing good, had a good reputation. But when the righteous turneth away from his righteousness and committeth iniquity, and doeth according to all the abominations that the wicked man doeth, shall he live? All his righteousness that he hath done shall not be mentioned. In his trespass that he hath trespassed, and in his sin that he hath sinned, in them shall he die. So you could have had a good reputation, and everyone applauds you and recognizes you as having been a good man and a faithful man, and a good father and husband and so forth. You get to the end of your life and you say, you know what, I'm tired of trying to walk the straight and I want to live it up a little while. Do a few things that I've always wanted to do. And you do, go out and you bring shame to the name of God or as a Christian, go shame to the name of Jesus Christ. 
and you think that the total amount of good is going to outweigh the total amount of bad, God says, all the good you've ever done will have been forgotten. You'll die among the wicked. You'll die among, as an evil man. You won't, be, you won't die uh, being considered a righteous man. So it had to be maintained all the way up until death. It was a very difficult life to live. Peter said in uh, Acts chapter 15, Why tempt you to the, uh, the God to put a yoke on the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we will, were able to bear? Circumcision, telling the Gentile believers they have to get circumcised and be like Jews if they want to really be right with God. Peter says, we couldn't even keep all that perfectly. And all the other laws that God had commanded, we couldn't keep all those things. Why do you want to force them to try and do it? So, you can make the case for dispensations and rightly dividing the word of it simply by comparing Scripture with Scripture. Think, and I should have mentioned this last week when we talked about the differences between the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God. First of all, they're two different words. Secondly, they have two different definitions. And there's a very simple uh, adage that says, things that are different are not the same. You think it'd be self-evident, but things that are different are not the same. One is the kingdom of heaven. That doesn't mean it's only heavenly and ethereal and invisible, but it's called the kingdom of heaven because the king of heaven will have a throne here on planet earth and govern over the universe and you and I as his saints uh, with him. The kingdom of God is a spiritual kingdom. The kingdom of God is not meat and drink, physical things, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost, Romans 14, verse 17. So you and I need to rightly divide the word. If God made promises to give a, a physical earthly kingdom to the descendants of Abraham, the Jews, they have never enjoyed it yet, but they're still with us. So you have to conclude that God still intends to fulfill his promises to them. Otherwise, there's no reason for Jewish people to be here. And yet they are. Yet they are. They may have difficulty uh, tracing their lineage, their family ancestry, and records may have been lost, but there's something inside the Jew. He knows he's a Jew. It's like the salmon, you know, swimming upstream to spawn every year. Something instinctive that tells them, you're a salmon, you need to go back up the river and lay your eggs. There's something about the Jew, and please, no one make any nasty comments uh, on, on their video that Mike Schreiber is calling Jews animals. No, no, nothing like that. But I'm just saying there's something in the heart of the Jewish people that know they're Jews. Even though the world hates them, even though anti-Semitism wants to accuse them of every evil in the world, <clears throat> Adolf Hitler once said, has there ever been an evil in the world in which at least one Jew was not involved? Of course, he was very persuasive and got millions of people to believe that nonsense. And you have millions of people around the world today who still believe that nonsense. But the Jew is still here. And the reason I know the Lord God of the Bible exists is because the people of the Bible still exist. And God intends to fulfill his promises to them you and I are sitting here today, 2019, watching prophecy be fulfilled before our eyes, living in, in very exciting times, getting closer to the catching away of the saints, closer to the rapture of the church. And what a wonderful time it's going to be.